Um, Sarah works every day to protect religious freedom for all Americans. As a Quaker and a queer, non-binary, white co-conspirator from the South, Sarah knows that their liberation is bound up with yours. Sarah has served with the ACLU of North Carolina, where she lobbied on a broad range of civil rights and liberty issues, including LGBTQ equality, reproductive freedom, the First Amendment, immigrants' rights, and the criminal justice reform. Prior to joining the ACLU, Sarah worked at Planned Parenthood for 10 years at both the state and the national levels. And today, Sarah is the Vice President for State Outreach and Engagement for the Americans United for Separation of Church and State. Let's all welcome her, Sarah Lickley Roo. Good afternoon. I'm likewise a short person, so. Thank you so much for having me today. My name is Sarah Gillooly, and I'm the Vice President for State Outreach and Engagement at Americans United for Separation of Church and State. Uh, it's good to be with you. I uh, echo uh, Debbie's sentiments earlier in the day as a Washingtonian that I am loving your weather here. And with a national network of more than 300,000 supporters, Americans United for Separation of Church and States works in the courts, in Congress, in state legislatures from coast to coast, in communities in every corner of our country to protect our country's cherished values of religious freedom for all, including the right to believe or not believe. I know I just said religious freedom, and now you're wondering if I'm secretly a plant from the religious right, although I hope my tie gives away that I am not. But I am here today to claim the true meaning of religious freedom. In America, we are governed by our shared secular values, not the privileged religious views of some. In America, we should be treated equally no matter who we are, who we love, or what we believe. And at AU, our members include devout people of faith as well as fervent non-theists, all united in two core beliefs, that our government must be for the people, for all people, and that religious freedom is not a license to discriminate. The religious freedom enshrined in our Constitution is meant to protect the right to practice any religion or no religion at all without harming others. But let's call out the truth. Emboldened Christian nationalists, the real religious extremists in this country, are weaponizing our sacred idea of religious freedom and turning back the clock for all of us. So Project Blitz, which Jerry just discussed, is one of the perfect examples of this. For those of us who share the belief that our government, government must be for all people, we should all be deeply concerned about Project Blitz, uh, and Debbie at American Atheist has some incredible brochures about Project Blitz in the back. I'm sure many of you have heard about Project Blitz. It's like the ALEC of Christian nationalism. It's funded by three prominent Christian nationalist organizations who've come together to write this 150-page playbook full of strategy and sample bills that they've distributed to more than 700 state legislators around the country. Their plan is strategic. They hope to pass a series of increasingly ambitious state laws, starting with things that feel innocuous, like In God We Trust bills or establishing Bible classes in our public schools but later escalating to laws that would permit religion to be used to justify discrimination. Our liberations are bound up. Each year at AU, we get hundreds of reports from around the country of violations of church state separation. A few years ago, we received a report from the parents of Bossier Parish, Louisiana. Maybe you've heard of Bossier Parish, maybe you haven't. And these parents were really deeply concerned about how their children were being treated in the public schools. Multiple religious freedom violations were occurring. School events were being held in churches. Sectarian prayer was often part of the official school program. Athletic programs were pr promoting attendance at religious services. The teachers and administrators often had religious displays in their classrooms. And AU sued. And in January of this year, we won by securing vital protections, regardless of religious belief, for all school children in Bossier Parish, Louisiana. Our schools, our government, they must be welcome and open to all people. But for the hundreds of parents AU hears from each year and the many more that we never hear from, that's not the America they're living in. Government must be open and welcoming to all people, whether they are Muslim or Jewish or pagan or atheist. And at AU, we're united in our core belief that religious freedom is also not a license to discriminate. Right here in California, AU is fighting Trump's attempt to turn religious freedom into a weapon to harm others. 
So earlier the year, the Trump admi- earlier this year, the Trump administration released a new denial of care rule. So this is a federal regulation that invites healthcare workers to use their quote religious or moral beliefs as a basis to refuse to assist a patient even in the event of a life-threatening emergency. Under this rule, seemingly any healthcare worker, doctors, nurses, receptionists, janitors, orderlies, anyone, could arbitrarily decide who does and who does not get healthcare. There are virtually no limits on what constitutes a religious or moral objection, and this rule threatens my health, your safety, and the dignity of all patients in our country. The government should be protecting patients' rights, not facilitating discrimination. That's why AU and our allied organizations filed a federal lawsuit in coordination with Santa Clara County, and we'll be in front of the court in San Francisco uh, this month on October 30th to stop this rule from going into effect. But healthcare isn't the only place that the Trump administration is weaponizing religious freedom. I wanna tell you about Amy Madonna. Amy Madonna is a mother of three children in South Carolina. Two of her children uh, are autistic. Amy's father grew up with foster siblings, many dozens of foster siblings over the year. And as Amy's children have gotten older, she decided that she too wanted to get involved in foster care, to volunteer, and to eventually bring foster children into her home. She signed up to volunteer with her local taxpayer-funded foster care agency. They screened her, she filled out the applications. At first, Miracle Hill was really excited about Amy. Given her experience with the foster care system through her father, and her own children, she was exactly the kind of volunteer and parent they said they were looking for. But then Amy went to fill out the next application. It asked for the name of her pastor. Amy said, I'm sorry, I don't have a pastor, but I do have a priest, I'm Catholic. And Miracle Home Ministries came back and said, I'm so sorry, no thank you, you're the wrong type of religion, we only place children and accept volunteers uh, from evangelical homes. So if that wasn't bad enough, The Trump administration knew about the discrimination of this taxpayer-funded agency. They granted Miracle Hill Ministry an exemption from federal and state anti-discrimination requirements, and they expanded that exemption to cover every single foster care agency in the state of South Carolina. And any day in the next few days or weeks or by the end of the year, the Trump administration is poised to release a regulation would ex- that would extend that same exemption from non-discrimination laws to every foster care agency in the country, including those here in California. These assaults on separation and religion and government in Trump's America, they are relentless. They're exhausting. But what do we do when our rights are under attack? We stand up and we fight back. And while the brilliant attorneys at AU and our allied organizations, many of them here today, one of whom you'll hear from later, fight every day in the courts and in Congress, what can the rest of us do? What can you and I do? First, you can support. You can support AU with your talent, with your treasures, with your time, and our allied organizations as well. I hope you'll sign up to volunteer. We have quite a few of our volunteer leaders here today. Uh, And you can join us through online platforms, through uh, in-person meeting groups, and support AU. And second, I hope you'll report. And I hope you take me especially seriously when I talk about reporting. We want to hear from you. When you see government that isn't open to all, when you see religion being used as a weapon to harm others by healthcare providers or social service agencies, call us. Go to our website. Click on report a violation, au.org. When you hear from friends in other parts of the state or the country experiencing that discrimination or government that isn't welcome to all, call us, email us, au.org, report a violation. But what else can we do? Now, a lawyer is gonna have a very different answer to this question, and thankfully, I'm not a lawyer. I'm an organizer. I help build movements. And the question I can answer for you is, How do we build a movement to make sure that all Americans are with us in our work to protect the fundamental value of separation of religion and government? What's clear is that we cannot focus alone on facts and the Constitution and the intricacies of the law. Now, I'm not saying that facts or the Constitution aren't important. Fact people in the room, of which I think I'm among many, we need you, we love you, we are lost without you. Keep those facts coming, but facts are not enough. We have to connect with each other. Debbie talked earlier about, the, about taking the theoretical and making it practical through organizing. Another way we make, cha- make change is to take the theoretical and the practical and make it personal. 
And we do that by talking about values. Values give our work deeper meaning. Enemies and outrage are really powerful motivators for immediate action, but they also exhaust us. Outrage fatigue is real and it is imminent. So we have to talk about our values because they inspire us, they draw a wider circle around us, and they ground us in what we are fighting for. We believe in a country where government is open and welcoming to all people. We believe in a pluralistic society. We believe in religious diversity. We believe that separation of religion and government is the only way to ensure religious freedom for all, including the right to believe or not believe. It is a protection for us all. We believe in a nation that is governed by our shared secular values. We have to talk about the world that we want. So we need to talk about our values, but we also have to talk about people. We have to talk about human impact. I find it easy when talking about church-state separation to talk about sterile legal principles. It doesn't always feel urgent, and it doesn't always feel impactful. Let me give you an example. AU heard recently from people in a community in Tennessee where their local police department has recently erected a memorial on the front lawn that features Christian scripture. Now this is blatantly unconstitutional and we should definitely shout that from the rooftops. But we also need to talk about people, about the human impact. How must it feel for the Muslim family in that community to walk past the memorial on their way in to report a hate crime? What does this memorial say to the atheist in the community who comes to the police department to file for a domestic order of protection? It says, you are less welcome here. This government is for somebody, but it's not for you. When we fail to protect our shared values of separation of religion and government, the impacts are real and human, and we need to tell those stories. And that means telling our own stories. In order to talk about our values and about people, we have to talk about ourselves telling our own stories, that's how we connect, and that's how we express our values, that's how we show human impact, that's how we build power. Our stories are how we build movements. So I wanna close with a story of my own from my own life. I grew up in a small southern town on the Florida-Georgia border. It is, it still is, the kind of town where kids fly Confederate flags from the beds of their pickup trucks, and every morning, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes at my high school would gather in the 90s around the flagpole, and they would pray, often loudly, for the sinners and the fornicators and the homosexuals in the school. Um, and when I was 16, I def decided I was gonna found a gay-straight alliance. I put together a group of small, small group of allies, and we went to the principal, and in an incredibly uncomfortable meeting, the principal said no. He didn't want to offend other parents. He didn't want to make students feel uncomfortable. He was very worried about any backlash or controversy. So he said no. And perhaps it won't surprise you to learn that I don't back down easily from injustice. So I went home and dialed up my AOL internet and researched the law. And I wrote the most scathing letter that a 16 year old has ever written to a principal in the history of time. And we won. He backed down and granted the permission for our GSA. But that's not the end of my story. Later that same year, I was invited to speak on a rally of the steps of the Florida State Capitol in support of statewide non-discrimination laws. I was incredibly excited and so proud of the work that we had done in my little high school. But I needed my parents to sign the permission slip and when I asked them, they said no. We were working class people in a small town and my parents were afraid that if either of their employers, both religious, saw me on the news, they would lose their jobs. With five kids in the family, it wasn't a risk we could afford to take. I didn't go to that rally. Not only was I heartbroken, I was angry and I was ashamed, and angry and ashamed that somebody else's religion could be used as a weapon to punish me and punish my family for who I loved and who I was. But here I am, 22 years later, standing in the shadow of this state capital, of a state with some of the strongest protections for LGBTQ Americans in this country. A state that says my employer can't fire me for being queer, but not just that. A state that says my employer can't fire me because of my gender identity. A state that says the hotel that I'm staying in right now can't kick me out because of who I love. That the suit shop down the street can't deny me services based on the sex I was assigned at birth. A state that says that your religion is a shield, but it cannot be used as a weapon to harm me. My teenage self could not begin to imagine this moment it is an incredible time to be alive. And I tell you this story because it gives us hope. In the words of my favorite Californian, Harvey Milk, I know you cannot live on hope alone, but without it, life is not worth living. So I ask you today to join me, 
to join me in the hope and the unshakable belief in the power of true religious freedom. As Americans united, we can hold our country accountable to the promise of a more perfect union, to the promise of freedom and equality for all. Thank you so much for having me today.